<laughs> Today, uh, we're going to have another Promo Justice Lecture Series talk. Um, just so that you know, these talks occur every month, and the goal is to provide opportunities for employment, opportunities to network, and also very creative ways to, I guess, learn more about the field um, of criminal justice. Uh, something that we're going to add the next semester are these hands-on uh, types of talks where you learn a skill or you get to interact and to see how someone is doing something specific in their job in particular. In February, we're going to have someone come to show us how uh, something is expunged from someone's criminal record. Um, and so, you know, just little things like that so that you can meet people who are actually working and ask questions. You'll know in advance who the talk, who, who the speaker will be. And so that way you can identify questions that you might want to ask or tell a friend or someone who would also be interested in engaging that subject matter. Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce now uh, Nick Lethwich. Um, he's a state drug coordinator, uh, drug court coordinator for the Supreme Court of Appeals of West Virginia. He's going to talk to us today about drug court, youth drug court, adult drug court, and also we'll learn a little bit about probation. So um, there are two uh, job applications for a probation position here, if you might be interested in this. Would you like one of these applications or is it not just for employment? Not yet? Okay, just in case. If it is, I want you to take this. So I'm going to leave it here. All right, so, all right, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Nick Left, which I'm the State Drug Court Coordinator for the Supreme Court of Appeals out of the administrative office uh, down in Charleston. Uh, kind of made the joke that it was nice to drive from Charleston to almost Charlestown to come up and spread the good news and the gospel of drug court. I was a probation officer for six years. Uh, I worked in the southwestern part of West Virginia. I had nine counties and I supervised uh, sex offenders, child abusers, and drug court participants. So yay, that was super fun. Uh, but now I'm in the administrative office role and my job is kind of the chief herder of cats when it comes to uh, treatment courts. So as uh, Dr. Howard Bostic said, uh, right now the Supreme Court oversees adult, juvenile, and now family treatment courts and veterans treatment courts. We'll get into the weeds here a little bit on, um, on what the types of specific treatment courts the Supreme Court administers as well as probation as a whole. Now. Two things. One, I want to kind of briefly introduce my my, uh, my posse, as it were. Uh, with us, we have the newly appointed uh, chief probation officer of the 23rd Circuit, which is Morgan, Berkeley, and Jefferson County, Sean Briner. Uh, behind him is my adult drug court probation officer, Crystal Gumble Shade, who serves Berkeley and Jefferson County, and then Erica Reiner, who's my juvenile drug court probation officer that serves Berkeley and now Jefferson County. So now we actually have people here that work the fields and work these treatment courts, uh, and now is overseeing all of probation here in the 23rd Circuit. So uh, I really, really hope that you, you folks take advantage and ask questions because they, they love to talk. Number two is there is a good possibility that uh, the incoming Chief Justice elect, Tim Armstead, uh, who is a sitting Supreme Court Justice may be popping in. Uh, I spoke with his honor last night and he's actually this way for a meeting and he wanted to know where and when and where, so I gave him that information. So if we, if you see uh, a justice come in, I'll be sure and let you know that how cool, how cool would that be to have a sitting justice come in and uh, he loves to talk and loves to mingle. So definitely if that, if that happens, please take full advantage. Just as a, um, <coughs> Just for my own edification, how many of you all have heard of treatment courts, drug courts, problem-solving courts, something along those lines? Okay, good. Very good. So here's just a brief overview of what the West Virginia judiciary looks like now. We have five Supreme Court justices, 75 circuit, circuit court judges. These are your judges of general jurisdiction. They preside over everything and anything. Your family court judges, 47 of those, 158 magistrates, 318 probation officers that serve all 55 counties. The asterisk there is because we're actually, the Supreme Court's getting ready to approve 10 additional 
spread out throughout the land. So probation, depending on how you look at it, probation is growing. Uh, more and more judges are sentencing folks to community supervision, and not necessarily because it's, it's cost efficient, but because there are more resources, there's more uh, folks, stakeholders involved that instead of just making uh, prison the ultimate goal here, they're trying to work community supervision, which we'll get into here, because that's the name of the game of treatment court. So that's kind of the overview of what the West Virginia judiciary looks like. Now, treatment courts. Right now I have 29 adult drug court programs that serve 46 of the 55 counties. 18 now, 18 juvenile drug courts that serve about half. Uh, family treatment courts, we actually have five of those and then five military service member courts. I'll talk a little bit about adult and juvenile drug courts here in a little bit, but family treatment courts is a brand new concept here in West Virginia. And it is a treatment court that their sole population deals with child abuse and neglect populations. Now, for those of you that are kind of keenly aware of how the criminal justice procedure works, when there is a petition filed by the Child Protective Services from the Department of Health and Human Resources, DHHR, a CPS worker goes in, makes a petition to remove kids because of whatever the factors, unsafe living conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that is a civil justice side of, of the whole uh, court procedure. So family treatment court, you're dealing with these folks that their kids, these parents, these respondents have had their children taken away because 90% plus of the total cases in West Virginia have a substance abuse issue. So when we're dealing with these populations, we're dealing with high substance abuse usage uh, with our criminal population. So in family treatment court, we are working with those respondent parents who are, who are addicts and trying to build a structure for them to not only get clean and sober, but in the long run, reunification, have kids return back to their families. Uh, this is a concept that has swept the nation. West Virginia is actually the 40th state now to start embracing uh, family treatment courts. Our state legislature just passed this past regu uh, regular session. Uh, back in January, they passed family treatment courts and military service member courts, which is drug courts for veterans. So that's a two really huge new uh, treatment courts that West Virginia is currently working with. So what are treatment courts? Uh, apart from them being administered by my office and the administrative office of the Supreme Court, treatment courts focus on two, two key aspects, treatment and accountability. If you have a participant, whether it's adult, juvenile, whatever type of treatment court, we are wanting to target those that have the highest risk of recidivism which means they're gonna go out and commit more crimes. We want those hardened criminals. We want to target those that have continued. They're the revolving door in the criminal justice system. We want to take those people because they have a high substance abuse need too. This is a brand new concept with regard to how criminals are sentenced. We all see it on law and order. We see it in our, in our criminal justice studies that you commit a crime, you get arrested, you go before the judge, you plead, you go to prison or you get probation as an alternative sentence. With drug court, it's an intensive supervision, an intensive, in, or an intensive outpatient program where the participant is gonna be subject to not only terms and conditions like they would be in regular drug court or in regular probation, but they're also gonna be attending group sessions and individual sessions. They're gonna be working community service. There is structure built to basically Humpty Dumpty back together. We're going to break down the bad habits of addiction. We're going to break down their old criminalistic ways, change their thinking, changing the criminalistic thinking that they are so accustomed to in their lives. Also with treatment court, we want to change their person, places, and things. If you have Billy Bob who continually gets in trouble with the law and he's accepted into drug court, maybe one of the reasons why Billy Bob keeps getting in trouble with the law is because he keeps going up the holler and dealing with that uncle or dealing with those cousins that are just continually using and abusing meth and heroin and all that. With drug court, we want to change that thinking. Those are triggers. So with drug court and the programming that they receive at the local day report centers or local licensed behavioral health centers or whatever the treatment provider, we're trying to, we're trying to again, humpty dumpty our folks back together so that they can see that life is not all about committing crimes and using drugs, okay? Any questions or comments about that? All right. Yes, sir. Which areas do you find have the highest concentration of drug users? Like, is there like a typical like geography or specific county or area that's 
more susceptible than others? Absolutely. Your more populous counties are dealing with the highest, the higher rates of substance abuse, specifically Cabell County, Huntington, Kanawha County, and Charleston, Mon Montegalia County, and Morgantown, Wheeling, Ohio County, and Berkeley County. All, the, all of our more populous counties here in the state are dealing with the higher rates of substance abuse problems. And then it just trickles out into the more rural areas. The problem, though, with ruralness of this state, because that's, I mean, it's West Virginia is one gigantic rural state, is resources, community-based resources, and transportation. Trying to get these folks to and from their treatment, or trying to get treatment regardless, is, is very, very difficult. One of the innovative things that we're working now in drug court is the concept of telehealth. Telehealth, where we have somebody, and it's 2019, and thank God we have the technology for it now, but having some, some place, some base of operations where we can have a setup through a secure like Zoom or Skype or something along those lines and have that individual therapy from hundreds of miles away. So right now we're working with Jefferson County's Day Report Center to provide individual and group therapy to places in McDowell County, which is the very southern part of West Virginia, but to have those opportunities for those participants that would not otherwise get it if they were in a more populous county. Yes, sir. What do they get into the system? Do, do they go into the criminal court first and then be somewhere? transfer it into your treatment court? Correct. So depending on the type of court, I'll just speak to adult drug courts right now. In adult drug courts, there's a crime that has occurred, they're arrested, and it can go one of two ways. There can either be a diversion before they get to disposition or before they get to sentencing, they make a plea. And drug court, if they complete or if they're terminated from drug court, depends on how the criminal justice process works. A lot of times, and I'm sure Crystal, my drug court PO, can speak to this, is as a term and condition of probation, they, they've pled, they've been found guilty, they've been sentenced to uh, the Department of Corrections, but it's been suspended in lieu of being on probation for X amount of years, and as a term and condition of probation, they have to successfully complete drug court. If they fail to do so, then that could be grounds for probation revocation, and then they go to prison. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, again, I've kind of touched on this. Drug courts uh, address addiction and abuse, substance abuse in the context of the criminal justice system. Um, I can't remember where I heard it, but I know it was, it was uh, one of the circuit judges in Kanawha County had said that right now addiction is a public health crisis, and West Virginia is ground zero. How many of you all have seen that documentary uh, based out of Huntington called Heroin? Heroin? Uh, it's based in Huntington. And that is ground zero for the opioid crisis. And they, right now, they have the highest number of drug court participants in the state. About 110 drug court participants spread between three probation officers. Uh, I mean, they, they are absolutely drowning. But the, the good part is, is that they are putting a dent. The work that's being done in these participants, my goodness, these participants who are caught up in uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking, and obviously they're, they're uh, committing these crimes, they come in and, and just attending these graduations, you see the reflection, you see the change in these folks, that drug courts are working. Drug courts are working. If these participants and, and the communities buy into this process, we're seeing lives changed. And it's, it's definitely refreshing for our judges that continually see these folks day in and day out on their dockets. But with drug courts, we're trying to, we're trying to target the hardened addict. We're trying to break down those, again, criminalistic thinkings that they're so accustomed to and rebuild them to become productive members of society like us. Just a little code action, because I'm a nerd when it comes to state code. Uh, here are your governing statutes with regard to how the legislature appropriated and then passed our drug court legislation. The bottom two there were passed here in 2019, Family Treatment Court, Military Service Members Court. Uh, so, eligibility, so treatment court eligibility. Uh, typically, there has to be an offense committed uh, in adult and juvenile drug court. Now, juvenile drug court, obviously, we're targeting the, uh, our kids here, but there are many different types of referrals that they can come in. You can have a, a uh, for instance, we get a lot of referrals. I'm sure Eric can attest to this. We have a lot of referrals from schools that uh, we have participants that have been caught multiple times either smoking marijuana or drinking copious amounts of alcohol, and it's a way of you're getting ready to get expelled, but in lieu of that, let's try it through drug court. Juvenile drug court's focus is more on early intervention with regard to these juveniles, because as you all know, their minds are still still evolving, still, um, still working up. So 
Juvenile Drug Court identifies those folks that are on that potential path to becoming addicts, to becoming criminals, uh, through risk and needs assessments, psychological evaluations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so with Juvenile Drug Court, you can take a referral at any stage. It can be a crime has committed or, hey, we got a referral from a school. There's a good possibility that this kid's gonna go down that path and Drug Court kind of intervene. So that's a little bit a little bit of a good way that the courts can be proactive as opposed to their common role of being reactive. Uh, drug courts should seek to serve those who have the most, again, severe substance use and dependence issues, uh, that high risk of recidivism and that high substance abuse need. We want to take the worst of the worst. When I say the worst of the worst, those that are those, cr those criminally hard-hardened addicts. Any questions or comments on that? Make sense? Uh, there's only, and this is uniform across all of our treatment courts, per the code, there's only two disqualifying factors, and one of which is that if you, if the offender or the respondent in the family treatment court world uh, has committed a sex crime, either in years past or that's their underlying offense pursuant to state code, they are not eligible for drug court, uh, as well as having a prior or current felony conviction for a violent crime. Uh, so we want to take those obviously those addicts but if there's a sex offense or a violent crime involved we cannot take them for family treatment court uh, the code that governs that talks about aggravating circumstances if you have a parent respondent that has had their kids uh, parental rights terminated before uh, if there was any issues regarding strangulation of another parent domestic violence issues etc etc then that would render them inel ineligible to be uh, in treatment Talk a little bit about referrals. Uh, anybody and anybody can make a referral to drug court, not just limited to the criminal justice actors, but uh, for instance, schools. We, we get a lot of those referrals in juvenile and adult drug courts as well. Uh, I know there's one in Putnam County, which is right next to Canal down in Charleston, but they uh, received the adult drug court, received a referral from the local adult career and technical college there in that area. So anybody can make referral. The underlying thing is that there needs to be a crime that has been committed and there needs to be a substance abuse need. That gets you in the door with treatment courts. Okay. Uh, with case types, you have the pre-adjudication. We talked a little bit about that after a charge but prior to conviction. Post-adjudication, after they pled. Um, Pre-petition to disposition. I mean, that, that's the range. It can be from the very beginnings of the juvenile justice system all the way to his attorney condition of uh, their juvenile probation. Post adjudication for the family treatment court, that's after there has been, after there's been those the claims made in the petition by Child Protective Services that there was some child abuse and neglect situations. The court has found that there are these, these circumstances, they have been found adjudicated. Per the state code for family treatment court, they are, these respondent parents are now eligible for uh, their participation in family treatment. So how long does it take to go through a treatment court if you're a participant? Per the state code, adult drug court and veterans treatment court is a minimum of one year. Uh, in my time in the administrative office, I believe there's been probably three or four participants out of the 10,000 plus that have been able to graduate in right at a year's timeline. It is a lot of work, and I'll get into it here in the next couple slides, but the minimum statutory time is 12 months. For juvenile drug court, it's a lot shorter because we're doing inter early intervention. Uh, that's a minimum of 28 weeks. With family treatment court, the minimum time there is 10 months, and that is because with the family treatment court, um, when the kids are removed, when children are removed from the house, there is a federal law that kicks in that there is X amount of months, I believe it's 13 months, that, they, that the court has to figure out permanency for the children. So with Family Treatment Court, we're under that 13-month requirement. So by the time that they graduate Family Treatment Court, the, the kids should be reunited with their parents or they are established in foster care or kinship. Um, there are, for phases and milestones, so in adult, juvenile, veterans treatment court, there are phases where phase one to phase two, phase three, and phase four, each phase has its own set of requirements. Uh, typically in the first phase and the first milestone for family treatment court, we're dealing with stabilizing the addiction, stabilizing 
the uh, participants' drug use because when we, like I said, when we talk about taking these high risk and high need folks, these folks have been hitting heroin, hitting mar uh, marijuana, hitting methamphetamines, the drug fentanyl, whatever. They're hitting it pretty hard, so we want to start them to get them clean and cleaned up as best as we can before we start working into our treatment plans. Uh, so th that's typically the first phase. Phase two is where you get into the meat and potatoes of their intensive outpatient therapy. They meet with their treatment providers on a daily basis where they are getting the group's individual therapies that they are so desperately needing, community service, searching for jobs, life skills, etc. Phase three and phase four is where we're getting ready to land the plane. They're getting ready to graduate. They've been equipped with the tools that they need to function as uh, productive members in society and then we cut them loose for graduation. So that's pretty much drug court in a, in a nutshell. And aftercare is kind of like a, a time frame afterwards where whenever you go from intensive supervision, intensive programming to graduation, they lose that structure. These participants lose that structure. So more often than not, we see that the data says typically within six months after graduation is when a relapse will occur because they had they were accustomed to that structure. Think about it, if you're in a program for a year, and typically the graduation, or typically the time in drug court, adult drug court is about two and a half years, uh, because there are usually setbacks, because life happens, we have relapses and, and all that. But when you have somebody that is so accustomed to that structure, and then you cut them loose, they, the participants typically don't handle that adjustment well. So with aftercare, it's a built-in safety net for our participants so that in the event that you relapse, it's okay, but here we are to catch you if you fall. So that's a way that it's like, yes, we've, we've given you the programming, we've given you the tools that you need to become better, but in the event that you fall, it's okay, we're here to catch you. So any questions on that? Yes, sir. You mentioned that you uh, had data to, to guide, kind of guide treatment programs. Do you guys, uh, make the participants like the surveys? Do you track, track information about them? We do, we absolutely do. So when they come to our treatment courts, that we get the intake that captures everything, their histories, the psychological evals, we get all the history <coughs> from that participant. As they progress, there are spot checks on from our office on how they're progressing, what types of treatments working, because there's notes that our probation officers put in and we, me, want to see from my office what's working and what's not working. And what's not working, I want to apply for federal or state funding to help address those needs. When they graduate, and this is across the treatment court board, when they graduate, they're given a, what I like to call the customer service uh, survey, where it's a two-page document where they go through and say, what did you like, what didn't you like, what, what would we have done better, et cetera, et cetera. So then we, those are sent to my office, we take them, analyze them, then we meet with the probation say, hey, this was identified, what resources can my office give you to help strengthen him? Is that uh, data publicly available? It is not, but my contact information is will be at the end of this. All you have to do is shoot me an email and I'll take okay. care of it. A lot of my students, we have a shepherd really interested in studying this topic. Okay. But we could never find data. I forgot. Or good data to actually do it for, this, for our capstone. So sure. I have access sure. To something. I'll get with me. I'll get you my email. Well, I'll hook you yeah, up. Like, uh, so when we talked about the phases, we talked about the components of drug court. We see um, this is what these folks are going to be going through uh, in, in all of our treatment courts. And I've kind of I've made it broad here a little bit. But you have intensive outpatient substance abuse treatment, self-help group meetings, NA, AA, all those types of self-help meetings. They'll be going to those. The name of the game with drug court is frequent, random, and observed drug testing. Um, at a minimum, at least in all of our treatment courts, if you're in phase one, you're going to be screened minimum three times a week. And those drug screens can be anything from urine, blood, hair, or patch, which is pretty neat. Uh, it's a patch that goes on your arm, stays up there for about a week, and then it's peeled off, sent off to the lab. So, and that's typically for our participants that uh, travel or work on pipelines or work out of state or something like that and can't make it to the drug screens, but it captures anything and everything that the participant may or may not be using. But they're going to be drug screened three times minimum a week. I mean, we have some drug courts that will screen seven days a week. They're open, uh, their day report centers, which serves as that one-stop shop treatment hub for our drug courts. They're, they are open 24-7, so there's participants that are screening at 6 p.m. on a Sunday evening or 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. I mean, it, just, it all depends on the program, but 
as the participants progress through the phase system, those minimum drug uh, testing requirements go down. But again, it's one of those President Reagan said it best, trust but verify. So if you're telling us that you're progressing well and, and you're doing well in treatment, you're following the terms and conditions, we still want to make sure that you're not using because again, that's the name of the game drug court. Ongoing contact with probation. Uh, one of the big things that uh, our office has started requiring is field supervision. It's an intensive program, and that means that our probation officers are going to be in their homes, in their in their situations. I mean, home visits are a huge, huge, that's my background. You learn a lot about people when you go into their homes and see them in their natural element. And it's not a, aha, we got you, when you go up and you find things. It's a, hey, these are the identified triggers that we are seeing that you were reporting the treatment, we see that crazy Uncle Timmy that comes over and is trying to get you to use drugs or whatever, maybe we should go away from that. Maybe we should move because he's just going to set you up to fail. So when our officers are in here doing their home visits, it's part compliancy check to make sure that they're following the terms and conditions that they've signed up for, but it's also to make sure for their well-being, to make sure that they are functioning well in the home post being in drug court all day. Because it's a whole lot different when you drug court from 8.30 to 4.30 at the courthouse or at the airport, but then come 4.31, you show up in the home, it can be a completely different picture. So that's where our drug court probation officers are going in and checking to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Maintain abstinence with drugs and alcohol, home, school, work, office visits, employment, community service, the whole nine yards. We're trying to get everything, again, Humpty Dumpty, these folks back together to piece them back together to make them more successful. <clears throat> Here's a little bit of data for you that we were able to see that the average cost for someone in adult drug court in the community is about $7,100 as compared to about $18,250 incarcerated in jail or $24,000 in the Department of Corrections, our Division of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Uh, there you see our last uh, most recent evaluation in our drug courts is that we have a uh, graduation rate is just over 52 percent. Um, what we like to see, or what we call it is it's the funnel approach. We have a lot of folks that come in for referrals, but as they progress through, the number of referrals, the number of participants trickles down, and you're only getting a couple of graduates, which is fine. It's not drug court is not built to save everybody. It's a lot of work, and it takes a lot of buy-in on the participants, the criminals that want to be involved in that. So you're seeing, for instance, I talked about Cowell County and Huntington. You know, they take over thousands of referrals a year, but right now I think they're on their 20th graduate. They're getting ready to have their 20th graduate here at the end of this month. So think about, I mean, it's, it's not for everybody, and it's a pretty intensive program. Uh, so there you kind of see that the recidivism rate for our graduates between the years of 2015 and 2017 is 9.4%. So once they, what that means is once they graduate drug court, there's a 9.4% chance that they will go out and commit a crime within the next two years. So that's pretty good. Uh, given the rate of how, or given the, the way that regular probation works um, with, hey, just come in once a month, we'll, you know, let me see your pay stubs, do a drug screen, all right, we'll see it with the intensiveness of drug court the program against their, their participants' minds are rewired to follow the directions, who would have thought. So if they're graduating, that means they've been able to follow all the directions, stay clean, develop healthier relationships, making good choices, and the proof right there is in the pudding that they are not committing crimes anymore. That's the name of the game there. Any question on that? So where does the funding come from? Right now, the Supreme Court of Appeals funds nearly everything associated with drug court. We pay, the Supreme Court pays for the salaries of our drug court probation officers, travel, training, equipment, uh, the ADC treatment, Veterans Treatment Court Services. All that is is our, that we have a partnership with our local day report centers across the state that they provide any and all services and they submit the court bill or, yeah, they give a a bill at the end of the month. The court pays for that. Juvenile drug court treatment services are funded through the Department of Health and Human Resources. Um, in adult drug court, there are, is a monetary uh, requirement. It's almost like a pay to play because the idea is that if you're progressing through adult drug court, you should be having a job and you should be able to pay, pay your court costs, pay your fines to get your license back, but you also have to pay into the program. That shows fiscal responsibility. Those fees that are paid into are then given back to, yes sir? Uh, 
Uh, is there any assistance for certain class demographics who can't do that? It so, seems like there's a barrier to entry to that kind of participation. Correct. You're absolutely right. And that's at the discretion of the courts. Um, in those circumstances, in my experience, uh, those fees are typically waived as an incentive. Uh, you know, you, you were able to pay uh, the maximum amount that a participant is uh, required to pay is $700 over that one year. If they can't meet it, I would say 10 times out of 10, our circuit court judges have said you paid 150, you've demonstrated good progress, et cetera, et cetera. You're square with the house. Yes. So it's back to the data. Do you guys like, keep track of like which types of drugs are abusive? In, in yes. Um, is is a prescription drug abuse a big thing? It is. So, it is. so do you ever do you ever try to use that data to leverage drug companies to pay into these things? Because it seems like there is, even if they don't intend to create that hazard, they are creating a hazard for this population, which is sure. costing the state and the public money. Sure. Statutorily, the Supreme Court is supposed to provide an annual report and uh, with regard to the drugs of choice, the drugs that are most uh, commonly abused in our drug courts. And that uh, annual report is posted to the court's website. Whatever happens to it is outside of the court's jurisdiction, if that makes sense. I, on behalf of the court, we, we will not lobby. We will not you know, yeah. go after big pharma and all that. We just identify that in our programs as a whole, our states, here are the top five. Right now, it's prescription drugs, methamphetamines, fentanyl, heroin. I mean, it's the whole nine yards. Those are our, our biggest things. With the money and resources that the federal and state governments are pouring into combating the opioid crisis, what we're seeing, and I'll probably get a name in for my drug court POs, what we're seeing is opioids, 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 with the money and the resources that are coming down, that's going down, the usage is going down, and methamphetamines on the rise. Because there isn't a Suboxone, or there isn't medically assisted treatment for methamphetamines. Uh, there is with your opioids. You have your Suboxone, those strips. You have your Vivitrol, which is a shot in your thigh that is supposed to be good for the month that blocks the inhibitors in their mind so that they don't get that high from opioids. Uh, but there isn't that case with methamphetamine. So we're seeing it not across the state, but nationwide, opioid usage is, is still prevalent, but it's not as big as it was five, 10 years ago. Methamphetamine's back on the rise. Any other questions on that? Good questions. All right. All right, so we talked a little bit about, we talked a lot about treatment courts, and I'm almost tying this up. Uh, with treatment courts and probation, uh, our treatment court probation officers are indeed that. They are sworn officers of the court. They work for, they are probation officers. Uh, these are specially dedicated probation officers that work uh, on top of other caseloads, right? Pre-sentence investigation reports, attending case uh, court hearings, etc. But they are working these intensity programs like drug court. Um, with regular probationers, there isn't a field supervision requirement. When I say regular probationers, these are your you know, breaking and entering, and your your third offense embezzlements or whatever. These are the folks that come and see their probation officer once or twice a month come to uh, the office, provide a drug screen, hey, how's life, good, all right, we'll see you. Uh, probation officers carry caseloads well into the hundreds. That's something that our office tracks. We actually we're just finished tracking because uh, we're getting ready to make a presentation to the court because we need to hire additional probation officers. I talked about that at the beginning of this. Uh, there's one particular county in the southern part of this state where uh, the chief probation officer carries 95 cases because they just, it just keeps growing and there's only six of them in the office of so cases are growing. So they're dealing with those regular cases. With intensive supervision, they are required by the administrative or by the uh, Supreme Court to be out in the field. I talked about sex offenders, child abuse, neglect, and now treatment courts. With sex offenders, again, that's my background supervising that, um, we are required, or they are, Probation officers are required to see these sex offenders at least four to five times a month in their home, in the field. That was my entire job for six years was going, I mean, I'd start, like I said, I had southwestern West Virginia, so from Mason County down to Mingo, that whole southern God's country down there. Uh, we'd get in the car, spend the whole day in Lincoln County doing visits, checking, compliance, making sure we're not out committing, re, you know, committing another sex crime, etc. Child abuse, neglect, the same folks. When that gets to the criminal level, when the child abuse neglect, although it starts out in a civil petition, but if it rises to the level the prosecutor decides to prosecute these folks for child abuse and gross neglect, they are subject to intensive supervision and now treatment courts. Uh, 
Uh, any questions on the, on the supervision type, or supervision as a whole with regard to probation? Because it's, it's huge, and it, it's a big wave that's coming across this state. Yes, ma'am. So with your treatment courts, is it still four to five times a month that you have to make those visits, or is it more regularly? So with treat with the treatment courts, um, I, I think we can all agree that the sex offenders are the ones that need the most tender love and care. Please note that sarcasm. Uh, that comes with the intensity part of seeing these folks. With drug courts, that's lessened to at least a minimum of three times a month, uh, and that can be relegated more to in, either in their homes or at their place of employment at schools and juvenile drug courts world. So there is still that intense, hey, we need to see at least, but it's nowhere near as, uh, as frequent as sex offenders. Although it is greatly encouraged to see them as many times as possible because again, it's one of those things where you tell us you're doing great when you come before the treatment teams, you, you say everything's going great, but we want to see how you're doing in the field. So the more, in my opinion, more eyes on them, the better, and the more frequent times on them, the better. Any other questions on that? So, kind of shifting gears here, this is where I'm going to bring up um, my good friend, the new Chief Probation Officer, Sean Briner. Uh, the duties and responsibilities of what, it, what does it mean to become a probation officer? Um, here you see just a, a, a creep, small tip of the iceberg list of uh, what those duties are, but it's writing reports. I know, is everyone in here criminal justice majors for the most part? Or, uh, social science major, let's put it that way. This and that. Okay. With that comes a lot of writing. Can I get an amen on that? There's a lot of writing, a lot of reports, a lot of papers, a lot of briefs, a lot of essays, a lot of all that. That definitely trickles over here in the court system with writing reports. Pre-sentence investigation reports are these reports that are conducted. They're investigations committed or conducted by our probation officers to give the court, the sentencing judge, here's the picture of Nick Leftwich. Here's his history. Here's his marital history. Here's his substance abuse history. Here's his education history. Here's everything you need to know that it gets before that certain judge before they sentence someone. It's huge. To take someone's, potentially taking someone's civil liberties, the judge needs every bit of information that they possibly can to make sure that this is in the best interest of justice and in the best interest of the victims of the case. So there, if you're wanting to, if you love writing, come on down to probation because we'll definitely love to take you. It's on top of writing reports, it's court hearings, meeting judges, talking with judges, talking with attorneys, meeting with probationers, doing drug screens, making referrals for services, working traditional and non-traditional hours. One of my favorite things in the world was showing up on Christmas Day uh, at these potential, well, sex offenders' homes and just, hey, Merry Christmas to you, let's do a drug screen. You know, that's, that's a great way to... Great way to start off that Christmas spirit. But again, it shows you that the court never sleeps. The court probation never sleeps. So if you are, are really gung-ho about wanting to make a difference, that is the keyest of key fe features here, is that if you want to make a difference in your community, being a probation officer is where it happens because you stand between that offender and the court. And they work with you to better themselves. You are that guiding, prodding, whatever you want to say. You're that guiding light for them to get their heads on the straight path to change lives. Any, yes, sir? Is being a probation officer potentially dangerous? It absolutely is dangerous because you are dealing with a criminal population. Let's call it what it is. You're dealing with a criminal population. Thankfully, um, the court provides some safety measures, defensive tactics, training, firearms training, bulletproof vests, the whole nine yards. But that's not that's not the whole game. That's not part of the game. There are probation officers that love wearing that badge and kicking indoors. Probation. That's not the name of the game here. From an officer safety standpoint, I want to make sure that every single one of my officers go home to their families every night. That's the reality of it. But you are dealing with criminals. You are a probation officer, you're dealing with criminals. So there is a safety a safety issue, a potential hazard with that. But the, the Supreme Court trains its officers to recognize and to protect themselves and the community. Yes, ma'am. When you're going for visits, do you go alone or do you oh, go Lord. with somebody? It, okay. <laughs> That's not more. No, I, I, absolutely, as you should be. It, I never 
ever, ever encourage any probation officers to do home visits by themselves. You're going into their homes, their home field turf. They know the nooks and crannies and places to hide. They know where they can hide things and or people and or guns. So when you, when a probation officer does visits, and our officers back there can definitely attest to this, they're either bringing law enforcement with them just as a safety measure, just as a, hey, get, watch my back while I'm trying to, to search this house or talk to this offender, or more common than not, they have other probation officers that go with them. But seeing them in their employment or seeing them in their school or if they're out at Walmart or if they're in, in, uh, at the day report, you can do that by yourself because it's a public-ish area. Uh, and you would be equipped with the tools to protect yourself if the, if the situation would arise about to this. Yes, ma'am. So I know um, my mom works for the state reporter in Kentucky County, where she's a little free free. Okay. Yep. The county area. And I know she has people like her clients come into the office mm -hmm. for like group sessions or if they need to get like drug tested or have those services. Yes. So does probation have an office where clients come in with them regularly or is it more of um, I will let my adult drug court probation officer answer that, Ms. Crystal. Well, um, we have a probation office where everybody, if you're on regular probation, you'll go there. And then my uh, treatment team provider, my treatment UMP is my quality service provider, is our Berkeley County Day Report Center. So all of our participants in drug court go to the day report. So I go there five days a week. Oh, good. So I kind of travel to them. They get lucky. I just didn't know um, safety. You're talking about safety of visiting people in their house. So I didn't know if there is a place where you can have that interaction more than the public settings. Right, but we do, like uh, Mr. Blackman said, we do a lot of emphasis. I went out last Friday night, I was out Sunday. We want to make sure they can stay in their environment. We want to know everything that's going on. So there's means and there's places. What we see statewide, to kind of further answer your question, what I see statewide is that our treatment courts, where they have that, where there is that symbiotic relationship between uh, the court and the day report, they, the day reports through their county commissions will have an office space for the probation officer because that's where their clientele spends most of their time. Uh, so I, especially a lot in our treatment courts, the drug court probation officers will be in those in those agency-based settings. But again, their safety, their safety precautions and measures are equip our probation officers with firearms and all that good stuff. So, uh, but for regular probation, they are housed in the probation offices typically. Yeah. Sure. Um, oh, no, please. Ask away. So, does probation officers have like a um, academy or like somewhere you go for a few weeks to learn those safety, like how yeah. to safely do those? Absolutely. Things? As a matter of fact, uh, Erica just actually came back from, so we get our training from the state police. So the state police training academy and institute, West Virginia, it's like five minutes from Charleston. Uh, if you have any sort of knowledge about the state police academy, they are the top, if not, and I know they're in the top two, but they may be the actual top law enforcement training academy in the United States. Uh, they pride themselves on that. I mean, they're, they're folks that come from not only all over the country, but all over the world that come and see how West Virginia trains its troopers and its law enforcement officers. So for two weeks, uh, our probation officers will go through defensive tactics training, which is everything from pressure points, holds, combat strikes, that whole defensive tactics, learning how to defend yourself in a situation, God forbid it ever escalates to that. And then the other week is firearms training, where you're actually trained by state police, state troopers, and certified law enforcement uh, training instructors. The Supreme Court also has uh, six or seven certified uh, firearms instructors too, and then twice a year, once once you become certified to carry, uh, there is a, uh, at least twice a year requalification that they have to. Our officers have to shoot and pass a certain uh, several several series of tests and all that. But again, I cannot reiterate this enough. That is not to be the cowboy and cowgirl kicking doors down, wearing badge, vice probation, get on the ground. That's not the name of this game. That is for officer safety, one billion percent. Lord have mercy. I cannot stress that enough. I, you think it's funny, but it happens. Unfortunately, it happens more often than not. Uh, so with that, I always add this because I get made fun of because in every single presentation I do, I always put the probation officers are those cheap herder of cats. I mean, just 
to think about that in your mind, trying to get every working piece together, especially in treatment courts, trying to get everyone's schedules to come in. Hey, we need to have this meeting. Hey, we need to talk. Or, hey, did you go and do, go to that IOP? Or did you go and do that drug screen? Did you do this? Did you do that? I mean, there's, it's you got to keep your head on a swivel. So if you love a fast-paced environment, probation is it. Probation is it. Yes, sir? For students who are thinking about doing probation courts, what type of advancement can they get from entering into this position? Like, what can they strive to be later in their career? A couple of things. Um, so every probation office has a chief probation officer, and in the bigger office, they have a deputy chief probation officer. Uh, here in the 23rd Circuit, which is Morgan, Berkeley, and Jefferson Counties, they have an adult, they have a chief, or I'm sorry, they have a chief probation officer and a deputy chief probation officer. So career-wise, working your way up that ladder to become eventually chief probation officer is one thing. But one of the great unique parts about with the Supreme Court is that the court will pay for your post-baccalaureate degrees. We will pay for you to go to college. And we'll give you money to do it. We'll give you a raise after every 15 hours that you complete up until master's plus 45, you get a raise. So not only does the court reimburse you for your education expenses, we're going to give you a raise for it. And no commitment, which blows my mind. There's no time commitment. So you can go and get your master's degree and from the court. We hope you stay, but anyway, yes, ma'am. Well, I do have a question, though. So can you get into With regards to getting your master's, and, yeah. And then you need to put time to school as well. So a lot, uh, when I did it, I did mine through the University of Cincinnati and through West Virginia University's master's degree program. It was all online. I had to go at least several times during the semester and make time to go to Cincinnati or go to Morgantown to meet with my advisors or present and all that. But and maybe Sean, you can address this better now that you're the chief. But I mean, if, if you are in school. Work, talk to your chief probation officers, and I'm sure that they would work around schedules as necessity dictates. That'd be my guess. At least the chiefs that I work for, they were super great. Like, hey, I can't be in court on Friday. Can you cover this case for me? I'll be out of town or something along those lines. So, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Chief Sean Breyer just to kind of, he is the face. He is the face of probation here in this area. Uh, he covers Jefferson, Berkeley, and Morgan County, so and that's why I'm so glad that he's here to just kind of talk about the day in the life of probation here in this circuit. Uh, and yeah, do, do your thing, man. What face it is? Uh, <laughs> more like the face. Um, so I, you know, Nick's hit a lot of the high spots on kind of what we do, and um, kind of hard to pick back off of Nick because he's done it. He's been there. He's worked in the field. He's worked with the hardest offenders that we have to deal with. Nobody wants to work with the offenders that Nick and his colleagues work with, so we're grateful for that. Um, somebody asked about training, and you're right. We do, there is a two-week training for defensive tactics and firearms, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. Uh, for there we need to improve on. That is not a mandatory training that you receive once you're hired. Correct. That's a training that you can go to if you choose to carry a firearm. You don't have to carry a firearm, but you can choose to do that. So unless you choose to do that right now, don't receive that training, uh, you have to, to get that when you have firearm training. We're working to get that changed. So because because of the requirements, whether you're in treatment court or whether you're in regular probation, there is an expectation for regular probation officers to be in people's homes, to be out in the field supervising. So with that comes that inherent risk of danger. So we want to make sure that people have what they need so they can be safe, come home at night, Absolutely. And, and make sure they're doing their job efficiently. Uh, we kind of joke. If you uh, are task oriented, um, it's tough. It's a constant distraction. Uh, a typical day for me is to come into the office, have a list of things I want to accomplish, and not get anything done. Because there'll be constant phone calls, drop ins, um, things go sideways for a defender who is kind of teetering on the edge of sobriety, um, trying to just triage those problems to help each individual person. So. That might sound doom and gloom, but that's the reality, I think, of working with people, no matter what area you work in, whether you're a social worker, a uh, crisis worker, a CPS worker, or a probation officer, you're constantly dealing with distractions. Um, now, one of the things that I love about my job 
when I was in when I was in uh, college, I got to do an internship in Mon County in Morgantown as a probation office. I walked in and they handed me 20 files, said read these, come back and see me on Wednesday. Came back on Wednesday, said great, those are your cases. Go deal with it, college kid. And that's what we did. And we dealt with those people. It was great. And that's how I got interested in the information officer. And one of the things that struck me then and still strikes me now is they took me into the back chambers with a judge, and the judge says, well, what do you think about this guy? And here I am, 21 years old, like, I don't know, judge, that's me, I'm just an intern. <laughs> but he wanted to hear what I had to say. And the judges in the circuit want to hear what the probation officers have to say. So part of that pre-sentence investigation process is analyzing information. It's, not, it's writing a report, that's, that's a big deal. It's doing the research for the report, but it's analyzing the information, trying to come up with a meaningful recommendation for a judge. So that when they go on the bench, they have every piece of information that they might need to make a, a good ruling, but also, you know, our job is to kind of make them look good, right? So if they go in and inform, they go in ready to make decisions the best that they can, and that's our responsibility to make sure we give them all that information. We spend a lot of time in court as a probation officer. Uh, sometimes it's waiting, and that's just the nature of the game. So uh, a lot of court time, which is what I like, I enjoy being a part of that. Uh, we talked about office space. Okay. Yes. Forget the office space. Um, <laughs> I'm being told to stop talking, which is great. And I don't like to talk that much. Uh, some of you picked up or were handed a uh, little six, seven page packet. This is uh, basic information related to uh, job applications for a probation officer spot here in the 23rd Circuit. We currently have two openings. Um, Probably be three. Yeah, so hopefully soon to be three between Morgan, Berkeley, and Jefferson counties. Uh, so if you have one of those and you're interested, please read through it. Keep the, my name and address is on there. You can send those to my attention. If you're not ready to enter the workforce and you know someone who is, please share that information. We're looking for driven, interested people who want to make a difference um, and are ready to get involved into a team environment. So hopefully you picked up something today that's interesting to you. and. Uh, you know, we encourage everyone to apply if you're interested in ready for work. All the basic requirements are there. And uh, some of you are um, you're in the uh, sociology degree program, or you're in the crime and society minor. If you are, Social 419 is an internship course, and there are internships available as well. So you may not be ready for full-time employment. However, you can do your internship as a course and then following that, you can impress upon them so much that they hire you once you're done with that internship. So um, it's important for you all to get your feet wet and get involved and actually be at a work site that can land you a job, land you a dominant, strong, positive network in the field, give you some great you know, letters of recommendation and so on and so forth. Um, I'm so grateful for you coming today. I want you to continue to come to these talks each month because as you can see, there are multiple professionals here who are here now for you to meet and greet and say hello and exchange information. Um, this is how we make sure that our students graduate and that they have opportunities. So um, take advantage of the engagement that I appreciate you. Um, have a wonderful day. Uh, be sure to stop by and say hello on your way out. Thank you. Thank you.